it is important to develop certain climate resilience. A global strategy has, however, very difficult to implement because every region, every city in the world uh, takes it differently. There are other conditions and needs. And so that is why every region or every city might need another strategy. And how can that be put into practice? That is what I want to discuss with our experts today. I'm looking forward to a very interesting panel with Kai Bergmann. Kai Bergmann is senior advisor on German low carbon policy and it's German watch. And he's uh, sitting on the Council for Climate Policy. So he's our expert for German municipalities. The second uh, guest, Professor Mumuni Abu, has a totally different expertise. He's his, uh, researcher for population studies at the Institute of for Population Studies of the Ghana University. He's senior lecturer there. Uh, he's uh, doing research on migration. This is also a very important uh, subject for Caroline Sigraf. She's deputy director of the Hugo Observatory of the University of Liège. And last but not least, Raya Mutarak. She is professor of demography at the Department of Statistical Sciences at the Universities of Bologna, Italy. And she may give us an insight on how global warming is affecting uh, fertility and other uh, effects. Thanks for having you. Kai Bergmann, you have been working on strategies on adaptation to climate change in Germany. Can you explain how, what are you doing? What are the strategies like for German municipalities? Sorry, I, must, I may correct you. I'm not uh, producing any concepts uh, for climate adaptation. I'm just an observer of German climate policy. And I look um, at how this is being handled between the federal government and the municipalities, how concepts are working, uh, but also I'm dealing with the attempt to um, adapt to the unavoidable situation in different uh, levels of governments in Germany. And I'm accompanying municipalities also in individual conversations about their perceptions and how to get uh, resilient. Uh, when we look at the German context, there are actually two different tasks which we feel are absolutely important and have to be done uh, or should be done by the municipalities. However, they are not being declared uh, important tasks for the municipalities. Uh, our municipalities presently are uh, pushing in front of them a little, um, uh, let's say, a host of different investment uh, in infrastructure which have been delayed. We have some rich municipalities though who voluntarily uh, take up this um, work of preparing climate protection concepts and adaptation strategies. And they are very good at that, especially when we speak about uh, climate adaptation concepts. Uh, there are 11,000 municipalities in Germany. Um, those are about 400 uh, rural districts and 4,000 smaller municipalities. That also includes, uh, however, the very big cities. And those municipalities which have uh, a good standing in their budgets and they may really afford to come up with such concepts and they really are facing the subject, but there are 15 or 20% out of these 11,000 municipalities in Germany. Those are the most recent numbers from the uh, Climate Adaptation Act of the German government, federal government, who are producing such concepts. They are producing heat uh, plans, uh, urban development concepts uh, against heat stress uh, in the cities, uh, better regulation of fresh air inflow. They also build uh, swamp cities, etc., so that the enormous amounts of rainwater, which we had in the recent month, uh, can also be retained. Um, we could even see some uh, flooding of entire municipalities who were flooded. And so they want to do a better water management and also pro provide coastal protection, etc. But it also means that there is quite a relevant part of uh, municipalities who don't have any climate adaptation concepts at all and who are not even able to contribute to climate neutrality in until 2045 by coming up with some concepts. 
for climate protection. And that is why we are demanding that in the federal government should not transfer more tasks uh, to the local levels, uh, although the federal government would like to do so. And we mentioned the adaptation concepts. Now they are trying to go um, to, to channel a federal law which wants to make um, municipalities responsible for climate uh, protection, but the federal government, however, cannot um, uh, force them to do so. Uh, it's up to the regional governments who have to decide though and to pay for it. And when it comes to payment, the federal government and the regional governments are um, disputing this. And unfortunately, it's always the local governments which get more and more tasks, but they don't get the budgets uh, to cope with these tasks. That's constant uh, problem. And so it lacks financial um, support and resources for really coming up with these uh, with, um, concepts. And even uh, investment costs would come on top so that even the municipalities which do have a, a climate protection concepts are lacking the investment uh, resources for really implementing those concepts. And that, of course, increases the risks so that the unavoidable is uh, overdimensioned. According to recent studies of Prognost, uh, uh, we are approaching 900 mil billion of climate uh, changes that could be limited to 236 million. These are already the consequences of climate change, but the less we do uh, in terms of climate protection, we are really lagging behind in that respect. Uh, it will really, um, the, the consequences will increase more and more and will hardly to be manageable. So now it's on, but um, it now depends on uh, providing the local governments with resources. To what extent is it important to uh, provide uh, for each municipality to develop its own strategy. Can't that be regulated at federal level? So you said it already uh, at the beginning. We have different geographic uh, conditions in Germany, a region such as the R Valley, which in 2021 had to struggle with enormous flooding and now have damages um, up, uh, between 20 and 30 billion. A lot of people died in that flooding. And we also have a lot of that people dying from heat in summer and so um, there are urban areas there are rural areas the damage caused by extreme weather conditions in december hit more than north of the country so they um, so when the fields are reflected, the damage is totally different uh, from the damage in cities where houses are damaged. And the insurance companies also said that they are, you can't even afford um, having insurance insured those um, areas because uh, you can't really market these policies anymore. And coastal protection in Germany, again, has different um, conditions and requirements. But at the same time, we had a drought in prior years in Germany with fire on also fields and crops and woods. So you can't say that each one of those 11,000 uh, local governments has to come up with its own adaptation concept. In the law, it is provided uh, to call for certain convoy uh, municipalities which come together and determine <coughs> the crisis or emergency plans for the region. But of course, we have to take into account the geographic situation of uh, each region. I do not want to, heal, um, to hide that challenges at the global level are much more different and uh, whether extreme weather conditions may cause much more damage in other countries rather than, uh, than in Germany. And so funding for climate resilience is very important. And uh, loss and damage um, has uh, also to be supported in other countries. But uh, Germany, uh, with its very different uh, geographical structure, is affected differently in different regions. So that, therefore, it's not possible to dictate everything from top, uh, for instance, in the R Valley. We had a very uh, sad uh, learning curve learning that uh, there are certain areas where you rather should not build any houses at all. So 
I mean, we have to take into account frame conditions at regional level. So you mentioned already that globally conditions are different and needs are different too. So for example, in the global south, Caroline Seacraft, you uh, studied Senegal, and I think it's very interesting that the situation at the coast of the country is totally different than in the center of your of that country. How is it possible there to develop a climate adaptation strategy? Yes, thank you. I, mean, I think Senegal is a good example of when we talk about variation, it's not just a variation in climate change between countries, but also within countries. So a country like Senegal is looking at drought and, and desertification in the interior, but then looking also at coastal issues uh, on the uh, on the coastline. And this creates unique challenges, but also connects these parts of the countries when we look at things like migration. So when migration is connecting what's happening in rural areas, so rural drought prone areas, and then people moving to uh, urban areas on the coastline, what we see is that people are not necessarily prepared for these changes. We often are kind of thinking that countries are, um, or people are moving from one kind of dangerous region in terms of climate change into a safe region. But what we're seeing is that these are really national challenges where you have to adapt both to rural drought conditions, but also to coastal flooding and flooding and other and sea level rise, for example, in coastal areas. So designing uh, national policies is, of course, extremely difficult when you're not talking about a single hazard, but you're also not talking about a single population, nor are you talking about a single ethnicity, nor are you talking about a single culture, nor are you talking about a single livelihood. So it is challenging for countries like Senegal, but also many countries that are experiencing uh, climate change to create some sort of harmonious uh, climate resilience or climate adaptation policy. But I think when we look at um, the national level, if uh, countries are taking into account how these things are connected through things like migration and have flexible, adaptable policies, I think it is certainly possible uh, in order to, to face these challenges simultaneously within a singular coherent strategy. You are also addressing migration as kind of an adaptation strategy to climate change. That is something Ms. Mutarek also dealt with. To what extent may migration also be seen a, in a working adaptation strategy to climate change? Ms. Mutarek. Yes, thank you. So actually, I think the first thing I want to emphasize is that People, well, human being actually uh, has always coped with some kind of changes like climate change currently, also in the past. So migration is one of many strategies that people would use to um, to address the shocks or adapt to the shocks that, that you experience because of, uh, it may not be the first thing. So say, imagine if you are a farmer in the rural area of a certain country, and then you experience drought for the first time, it doesn't mean that uh, in the next year you would just move. So you may try something else. You may try um, uh, to plant different crops. You may change the uh, uh, the timing that you would plant the crops because you may anticipate the rain later and so on. So, so we, we should just think of migration is just one part of the the, the the way that people may may use to to adapt to climate change. So yes, it is one adaptation strategy. And then um another thing I want to say is it depends on how you how you want to 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 categorize migration as well because migration can be um we can distinguish into two types. It can be the first one is the reactive one. So something happens suddenly like uh, storms or floods, hurricanes. So you have to move. So in that sense, of course, it's an adaptation. It's more like the coping. Your house gets destroyed, you have to move. So that's that's a, you may, you may say it as adaptation strategy in that sense, it's a survival strategy. Another type of uh, uh, migration would be, we can call it a proactive type of migration. So you have time to plan. And in this part, it's you can also see it as, as, as the long-term plan that, that one may think if, uh, in I think the, the, the classic case would be if you anticipate that this area would experience sea level rise in the longer term, uh, 
unfortunately, if we don't make a change now, it, has, it should be done uh, before the mitigation. If it's not done uh, seriously, if we don't reach the net zero carbon emission very soon, then sea level rise is going to be very challenging for many places. And that you can plan the migration um, as an adaptation strategy for certain places. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Ms. Seacraft, you are also dealing with migration. Are you, do you agree with Ms. Mutarak and what is your opinion? What are the main important factors which have to be taken into account in developing the climate adaptation strategy? Um, yeah, I, mean, I certainly agree with Roy. I think she did a great job uh, breaking down also quite quite um, distinctly what, when we talk about migration, how we have to think about it in multiple ways, both reactive, proactive. We have to think about the positives and the negatives when it comes to building migration into national adaptation plans, which you know, currently I think is in, inadequately done. Um, and I think that one of the big things and factors to take into account would be, of course, livelihoods. And again, this is coming back to what Raya was saying. You know, are we talking about fishing communities? Are we talking about farming communities? Are we talking about non-natural resource dependent economies when we're talking about uh, building a national um, but also localized adaptation plan? And what I'm seeing in my work in different countries is that it's not just even the livelihood that defines um the climatic challenges and opportunities, but it's also thinking about social differences and cultural contexts. So, you know, how are men and women being, um, are facing different adaptation challenges, but more importantly, how are men and women, um, as well as elderly, young, you know, really from an intersectional perspective, how are we building into climate adaptation plans equity, you know, the idea of social equity, and I think that that is one thing that is also important to factor in on top of livelihoods, not just that people are farming or fishing, but whom is farming or fishing or not dependent on natural resources. And how do we kind of make adaptation plans, not just tailored to local context, but tailored to social inequalities and making sure that things like migration, whether proactive or reactive, are considered um really on a, a level that considers social difference. Um, and that goes beyond migration. I think building adaptation plans that are cognizant of cultural realities and the idea that you can do that at some sort of international level without considering these differences that are steeped in histories, that are steeped in colonial um, backgrounds and contexts. I, I think that that would be kind of a, a false premise in which to, to build uh, climate adaptation or resilience plans. Yeah, often. If I may, Marie, to just to yeah, follow up a bit, because I think Caroline touched upon like the very heart of the uh, the demographic research that we 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 try to understand as much as we can, like the different vulnerability or different adaptive capacity that different groups of population have. And I think Caroline pointed out very strongly that it's not only the location, because within the same location, you can imagine within the same household, uh, the impact of climate change would differ by maybe younger people, young children would be more sensitive, for instance, to um to malnutrition if there's if household experience floods or droughts, whereas we know well, with heat wave, for instance, it's, it's an older population, typically over 70, 70, over 75, that we have to, to be careful. But I want to add another point that Caroline mentioned in terms of addressing the social inequality, or sometimes we may call social justice as well. Um, so when we, we make a plan, right, so adaptation strategy, it's extremely important and equally important. I think it shouldn't compete with another. It's also mitigation. So we talk a lot now about uh, uh, how do we transition, um, transform the society into more of the most clean energy, net zero carbon emissions. And, and, and of course, this transformation, it's, Overall, we want to re reduce carbon emission, but in the process of doing so, someone would be disadvantaged or someone would win, someone would lose, for instance. Uh, I think the, the classic case, for instance, if we want to fade out from coal industry, for instance, we know that countries like Poland, for instance, um, is relying a lot on coal. So maybe 
I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 people or more would lose the job. So that sensation, it's good or or for, for Poland and for the world as well, but we need to, to understand that uh, such type of policies, who who may get disadvantaged and need to address that as well. That, that's the point I'm gonna add. Yeah, very interesting. Well, this is really exciting in any case. I also believe that the difference between the different countries and also global responsibility, which we have in the, uh, that respect between different countries, especially uh, the Western countries in the North. Mumuni Agu, Abu, what would you say? Could, how could that be designed uh, to have a climate adaptation strategy at a global level? And perhaps what kind of support should we provide uh, between different countries or which different countries should provide? Yeah, so if if you talk of climate adaptation strategies and then you are thinking of it, putting up a strategy at a global level, uh, that may not necessarily work for every country because if if you take the demographics across the globe, it's totally different. And once you have differences in these demographics and in terms of even our vulnerabilities, our vulnerabilities are also different. So it will be very difficult to have a one fit all approach. And if you listen to the earlier presenters, uh, the earlier speakers, they, they all talk about even within countries, you still have these kind of differences. So some of the adaptation strategies that are even put uh, forward at the country level may not uh, necessarily work across the entire country because, uh, for instance, what pertains in the rural area may be totally different from what pertains within the urban area. Uh, in terms of Africa, for instance, if you look at our demographics, Africa has one of the very young populations. Uh, we currently can talk of about uh, 1.2, uh, over 1.2 billion people in Africa. But uh, this is also a population that is going through a lot of challenges in terms of issues of poverty, and other associated issues. So climate change uh, more or less exacerbates some of the conditions already being faced within the continent. Uh, if you equally look at the fertility situation in Africa, uh, on the average within the continent is just about 4.3 children per woman. Uh, that may sound uh, high depending on uh, how you look at it. But across the various uh, regions within Africa, there are different fertility levels. And this also has implications in terms of these uh, climate related issues and uh, possibly the kind of adaptation strategies you can put in place to be able to address the issue. If you take West African countries, for instance, we have a very young population. Uh, if you take the North African countries, for instance, yes, there are elements of young population, but you equally have symptoms of aging population equally setting in within some of these regions. So we are faced with a double kind of burden. You have the young population to deal with, you also have the aging population to deal with. So if you are putting up a climate adaptation strategy, then you need to think across looking at all these kind of populations, the challenges they are facing and how you can fit in your strategies to ensure that each and everyone benefits from this. So Yes, at the global level, there can be some kind of a policy, but uh, it is not a strategy that may fit uh, every country. There, there should be some specific regional kind of policies. And I know within the African Union, there is already a climate adaptation kind of strategy that was uh, accepted by the heads of seats uh, sometime in 2002. So there is a 10-year kind of strategy that is currently uh, being rolled out but even with this kind of strategy, you move across the various countries, there are differences. And if you move to the micro level, even within the household level, as Raya indicated, there are differences because the needs of children are totally different from the needs of adults. And the needs of women will generally be different from the needs of men. And these are things that we need to put into perspective. And also to look at the individual capacity in terms of our economies, how do we look like? What kind of advantages do we have? The entire African economy is barely around $2.2 uh, trillion. So if you have such an economy with all these kind of challenges, how is the continent going to support itself? We, do we need some support from other kind of development partners? And what support do we need? And what are we prepared as a continent to also put in to ensure that 
once you receive that kind of support, you are able to move to the steps wherever you want to get to. So I would say, yes, strategies are good, but it needs to be developed at the various levels. And then we try as much as possible to see how we integrate it together, but we cannot have a one fit all approach. Um, Frau Sickraff, genau, sie hat sich gemeldet, uh, wann sie darauf reagieren. Do you want to answer? Uh, no, I, I think Muni's uh, Professor Abu is making an excellent point, and I just want to kind of provide the, the complementary example that shows why this matters in different places and how it manifests. So when we're talking about African contexts where you have high fertility, but then, for example, I'm coming to you from Thailand, And I just uh, was in the doing field work in the Mekong, and we have a bit of a different situation where you have actually lower fertility and dropping fertility rates. And what we're seeing is in rural areas, you have uh, you know the pressure on the environment, and then you have low incomes, people who uh, choose to or feel obliged to to go to places like Bangkok to to work to provide income to support their families, but you have. That leaves kind of a gap because as you have few, fewer children being born, you can't divide between five people the responsibilities and say, okay, you go to Bangkok, you stay here and take care of our parents. So you're seeing both labor shortages in rural areas, um, but also importantly, again, like this elderly population who doesn't have people to care for them and who in fact are taking care of uh, their grandchildren. So this manifests very differently in one country to the next. So here you have a challenge that's kind of, it's different, not right, not necessarily better or worse, but just it, it I think underlines and underscores the importance of how fertility rates can be challenges in both ways. So here you have elderly people who don't have people to take care of them who are also taking on um, caring responsibilities for these children who uh, are born to people sometimes who are migrating, living in other places. So it's just to kind of support, I think, what Professor Abu was saying and showing exactly how this is, we can't just say fertility as a challenge or demographics as a challenge globally and let's create some sort of, uh, you know, homogenous uh, global international plan. Um, and yet always, these plans that are international have to consider some things like what are the demographic challenges. So on that level, we can, you know, have some sort of uh, mainstream approach that considers things like gender, um, like age, uh, livelihoods, etc. But at the same time, manifests very locally and again is able to consider that um, not just even at the no national level but the local level. Yes, thank you very much. This was definitely very valuable input. This global responsibility you both addressed, Mr. Bergman, to what extent is it the case that Germany and the European Union are aware of the fact that they have to support No, how to deal with the climate crisis, um, you know, this requires uh, manifold strategies as we have carved out. And Germany and the EU always try at the world climate uh, conferences to be driver of the international development. And uh, at this responsibility level, it has something to do with the fact that uh, those uh, countries which are not so strong with economies um, like Germany or and the EU, for these countries to be enabled to be implemented or everything we discussed. It's less about, like my uh, colleagues said, to have one blueprint plan, one multinational organization that plans the adaptation for all countries. No, it is about uh, enabling the sovereign states uh, on the one hand to pursue climate protection. This was the first thing that was negotiated at international level, namely the Green Climate Fund. In what way can, through redistribution of money, states be helped to elaborate climate protection concepts and to see how climate protection measures, that is how the switch from fossil fuels to renewables can be successful? And this also includes that the promises made, that is, um, one is very likely, you know, to create such funds, but to flesh them up. And there was the promise to the international community that the big industrialized states who 
were most active in pushing uh, this for this climate change because of their industrialization in the past 200 years, that 100 million US dollars should be put into that fund 2020. This should have been completed that only last year was that achieved at the last uh, COP. At the previous COP also finally, also um, because the Germans pushed for that at, la at that time when they were in the presidency of COP, the Germans christened this loss and damage fund. And we already see that extremely many losses and damages have been incurred. And to compensate for such damage, this is what this loss and damage fund was founded for. And Germany was one of the first countries who made pledges, namely 200 million euros to be made available. In the face of the actual damage, this is of course peanuts, but to install such funds at international level in the first place so that money can flow. In this respect, Germany and the EU have always been a pioneer to ensure that for international justice reasons, such uh, instruments are created. The other thing now is a so-called adaptation fund, namely money to be made available via funds to those countries so that they can cope with these adaptation strategies. And all three things have to be done. All of us have to radically change uh, to enable things uh, stay as they are uh, approximately. This is climate protection, but what is inevitable, what we have already caused and at the moment, our ex emissions are still uh, rising. Uh, we have to adapt to what is inevitable. And uh, on the way there, there will be a lot of damage and losses. And for all these three fields, there must be a redistribution from those uh, countries who have uh, um, incurred the most guilt and responsibility so far, but also countries who have, uh, as newly uh, industrializing um, countries left the least developed country status and are catching up, slowly have to be integrated into this responsibility. And this is why it was great that the Arab Emirates that headed COP recently as one of those who are enormously rich, but because of the UNCC uh, architecture were still regarded as a developing country, now for the first time felt responsible for joining forces with Germany in this initiative uh, of uh, the loss and damage fund, namely a cooperation between a rich industrialized country and a uh, today a newly industrializing country, which is still uh, under a different definition at the moment. So that we jointly said, let's assume this responsibility and have the first pledges in this fund. Today, several states have followed up to this. The German problem will now be the problem we are also warning the German government of as a developing aid organization, that while flashing up and filling these funds for 2025, that is the COP, and this year would be a purely funding-oriented COP where exactly these questions will be discussed between the industrialized and the least developed countries. This must be negotiated, the whole funding architecture. We see at the moment that based on the national facts and circumstances, namely that under the rules of debt capping, especially in our national context, there's a dispute about how capable Germany in fact still is. And that now federal budgets are being composed where it is also being addressed whether in international climate funding no increase of the funds can be promised anymore. And this is what we are warning of because we're saying it can't be that uh, savings are made at that end, while in other ends, there are incredibly many subsidies given to our national economy, which uh, fuel the climate crisis. And this will be a very uh, tough uh, dispute at uh, German level, namely that Germany also meets its obligations into the future rather than starting uh, to uh, backtrack with these international promises. Very exciting input. Mr. Abu, you work at the University of Ghana. What's your perception? This uh, funding assistance, is there's global assistance available there? And what would happen in the case Mr. Bergman addressed, namely if there was backtracking on funding? How could these climate adaptation strategies be financed in other ways? Yeah, so uh, there has been challenges with funding. And uh, uh, what I know is that if you take most of these African countries, we have uh, these national adaptation plans. We have nationally determined contributions. So there are all kinds of policies that are available in relation to climate change. 
uh, individual countries have climate change policies. They have uh, quantitatively look at how much it will cost them to address some of these issues. And sometimes they look out to some of these uh, kind of funding sources to be able to finance some of the climate related activities that they have put in place. What I can tell you is that uh, most of these documents are just on paper. In terms of implementation, a lot is not being done because of uh, lack of funding to do some of these things. I know uh, countries have, uh, within the African continent, other countries, some countries have begun uh, doing some kind of local initiative to see how best they can equally address some of the climate uh, related issues based on uh, locally generated kind of funding. So currently in Ghana, I know the government has introduced what they call the emission tax, which is already creating all kinds of problems. I, uh, people, uh, there are some even uh, public sector workers who are, who are ready to demonstrate against that because it also goes to the issue about uh, what is our contribution to emission and why should I be paying emission tax? So all these debate is, is also going on. And uh, so generally funding has been very uh, not forthcoming in this area. And uh, to mention the Green Climate Fund, uh, it's not a straightforward uh, kind of issue to just get money from the Green Climate Fund. You, you need a winnable proposal. You need to compete and you need to convince them uh, to be able to win. And a number of these countries have not had the opportunity and sometimes even the skill to be able to put that kind of a proposal together to be able to win that kind of money to implement some of their, their projects. So yes, uh, you may have uh, some countries committing resources or making pledges, but as to whether these pledges end up in uh, some kind of practicable kind of solutions within some of these uh, some Saharan African countries, uh, is, is something else that we all need to think about in the future. And uh, some of us look forward to a situation where uh, technically as, as a sub-region, uh, we can raise our own kind of uh, resources to be able to address some of these issues in, in, in our own way. Uh, they say you are the one who is being impacted. And so once you are being impacted and then you have some kind of local strategies in terms of how to be able to address this, I think we need to capitalize on some of the local techniques that uh, uh, we know. Some of them may not require so much huge funding. You, you may need technology to make it work better, but with the local kind of wisdom that we, 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 we have, I think once we, we move more into that area and probably make do with it, uh, it will be in the interim help uh, the continent to be able to address some of the issues that we are going through. And then possibly in future, if we are able to raise the kind of funding to go into some of the mega kind of projects that will help. I'm saying this because uh, if you take agriculture, for instance, you may be looking for maybe a very sophisticated kind of uh, irrigation facility to be able to do some kind of good agricultural activity within the Sahel in Africa. But within the Sahelian region, they've been living there for years. And they have their own local strategies of being able to adapt to some of these uh, drought-related issues. And they have their own way of doing the irrigation. And that irrigation has been tested to be very robust. It's just an issue of investing in it and making it more practical. And these people have survived with it over the years. But if you go there with even some of these sophisticated types of irrigation that we are talking about, if you don't take time, <laughs> by the close of the season, your 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 your, your irrigation dam may probably even dry up. But those kind of local ones have survived. And as much as we, we, we integrate some of these local technologies into some of the other kind of, uh, the, the new, the modern sophisticated kind of technologies that are coming up, I think we'll make some kind of strides. And we don't necessarily just have to wait for some of these international kind of supports or commitments that are made sometimes at international meetings that don't end up coming. Ja, sehr spannend auf jeden Fall dieser Aspekt, um, dass auch yes, uh, yeah, this is, it's a very exciting aspect, namely that those people who are involved and live in the regions certainly also play a major role. Ms. Sigrev, is there any certain example you're aware of where this uh, climate adaptation strategy works particularly well?
where, I'm sorry, a successful example of, of any type of climate adaptation strategy? Sorry, I just need a bit of clarification. So I yes, can, yeah, uh, of any, yeah. Um, any, um, <clears throat> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a little bit in a, my mind is, is enthralled with Professor Abu's response because I think it was so important how he was his highlighting really local knowledge, local um, adaptation strategies and how these are often left out of the conversation because we're so concerned with and thinking about this as some sort of top-down strategy and not just about where we find funds, but where we find solutions in general instead of looking at actually local level adaptation strategies and you know I, I'm gonna come back to to things like migration because migration is something that of course sometimes is discussed at the international level oftentimes framed as something that's so problematic and we so focus on uh, one type of of displacement that's that's involuntary but what we see locally in some places is that these have long histories people have long histories of adapting to not just environmental change or environmental challenges, but economic challenges, social challenges through migration. So when we talk about uh, adaptation to climate change and local strategies, we can talk about um, nomadic groups. We can talk about herders. We can talk about um, people that we often think of as the most marginalized and um you know, often the ones who are not who are the least to, to the least likely to receive any of these adaptation funds are often the ones who have had the longest experiences with adapting to climate change and environmental change more broadly. So, yeah, I'd say successful adaptation strategies. I mean, based on whose idea of success would be a bigger question, I think. But um, certainly, we can look at people who, like my the communities I've worked with. Um, in my experience in, in Senegal, for example, fishing communities, when we talk about migrating because of climate change, they're not starting from zero. They're not talking about, oh, well, climate change happened and now we have to like, kind of you know react and, and adapt to that. They're talking about how do we integrate these new challenges or rather these like escalating challenges into our histories of migration. So fishers aren't new to the idea of moving because of environment, right? The fish are moving and so people move and they say, yeah, we used to move maybe more to one place, but now we move more to another place because of these changes. But it's not that movement is new. So I would use, um, you know, not all migration is, as adaptive necessarily, but uh, certainly I would use that as, as a local example of, for example, fishers, maritime fishers who migrate or or borderlanders, um, nomadic peoples who who have always used uh, migration and movement, let's say more broadly, as a response to various forms of hardship or just natural cycles of change in terms of seasonal you know, fishing migration. So I would say that that's probably, a, for me, what comes to the fore when I think of both listening to Professor Ramuni Abu and, and what that brings to mind when it comes to you let's say successful again based on what idea of success i think that that's another question um strategies to adapt yeah sehr interessant ich will an der stelle noch mal very intriguing at this point let me point out that you also have the chance to ask questions we have so much time left so in the q and a and you will find the slot there and the panelists can also answer them mr bergman also raised his hand do you want to respond to this Yes, I would like to offer two observations. However, this would open up a new topic. I don't know whether this makes sense or whether we just should dedicate ourselves to the Q&A questions. Otherwise, I would have followed up to what we just discussed. Two points which I'm extremely worried about. We know that from the German, in inverted commas, public media contexts, that absurd discussions are sometimes conducted. There was a moderator once who confronted his guests, even uh, climate activists among them, where he said the history of mankind is a history of adaptation. And he sometimes wondered whether these statements on the climate crisis should be uh, taken so dramatically, in fact, because uh, humans have always adapted. And if not we, as a highly, as a high tech country, Germany, if we uh, cannot adapt, who else can? And at the same time, one of the most leading uh, climate researchers, Mr. Schellenhuber, said recently what the 
global community so far has agreed that is which uh, goals they pursue. In Paris, it was defined that we want to uh, keep the climate change down to 1.5 degrees centigrade, but what we are heading at is a 2.8 to 3 degrees world. That is a world where people have not yet lived. So these statements, like we can adapt to this, and there will be migration strategies. I mean, Mr. Schellenhuber said, if we really are heading for a three degrees world, then all um, biotopes along the tropical belt are so heated that as a human being, you cannot stay outdoors anymore. And he thinks that this would uh, cause uh, the flight of up to three billion people. So this is the thing that cannot be managed anymore if we don't focus even more on this uh, joint climate protection, then we will run into that situation. And then these will be migration issues. You know, I would like to shed light on the European uh, situation, you know, and the de debate about migration to Europe and in the German debate, I perceive that suddenly border or limits come down, we need different strategies of fencing off uh, people asylum procedures, if possible, to be conducted in the states of origin so that people don't reach Europe in the first place. And in the past, when in 2015 we had that German debate, it was always said we need to uh, look much more after the causes of uh, flight so that people don't need to migrate. So this is something that is totally missing in the German debate today. No one talks anymore about this. It's just talked about what can we invest in better border protection in Europe? And what can we already do in the North African states to install systems to decide there whether we um, let people into Europe or not? And the prospect of how many refugees we will have at a certain time, uh, this is totally counter to that. And what I'm scared of, that is in this European debate, this topic of uh, combating the causes of uh, refuge is uh, not uh, is diverging our interest uh, from development in the African region, from developing employment, so that the young generation has the chance to stay in their culture. And my fear is that this is now totally um, getting out of attention in this debate, especially also the public debate in Germany. Ms. Sikrev, do you want to respond to this? I just want to, um, yeah, I think that this is a good example of where um, Sometimes the the discourse completely is disconnected from reality because the discourse is controlled by the powerful few, and so that has no right. These ideas that that um, were brought up about you know border control and the, I mean even the, this idea of three billion uh, people moving because of climate change or it's. What does that even, you know, what does that mean that that we're assuming like that three billion people moving because of climate change and they're all like it's a threat, right? It's a threat to Europe or it's a threat to some sort of destination. But that's again, people migrate for good reasons. And most people don't migrate to Europe if they're coming from another place, nor do they want to. So I think that this is, again, where. Um, I think it's a good example of how if you try to come up with some international policy and, and even a discourse on, on migration or action, uh, we can't act like everybody has an equal say or influence over the narratives that drive these international policies, because they're often disconnected from empirical realities. They're based on things like xenophobia, things like populism, and most importantly, not based on science. Um, so I just want to kind of, yeah, I, you know, support was being said in that well, the way that these things are framed are, are yeah if that's who's driving international policy these discourses and these ideas then you know good luck to us all yeah vielen dank um, yeah have... thank you i have seen that there is the first question which came in i would like to pass it uh, forward to raya mutarak 
and resettle to other safe areas, but they move back despite of the dangers because cultural and historical issues tie them to this place, which means that resettlement programs do not take these cultural features into account. What can be done to overcome these challenges and any other examples? Um, yes, so I think <laughs> at least from 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 the the research point of view, right? So it's um we we tend to overwhelmingly look at do people migrate or, or maybe recently or who who do not move and so on. But um uh, looking at people moving back, it's much more difficult to capture in terms of data. So I think the uh, one first thing it it sounds probably uh uh very research oriented but but we, we we don't have enough information actually of of uh of, of who moved back return migration or even circular migration i think qualitatively we kind of know that this is what the common practice but like if you think about the number and so on we don't know much and i think the first thing is how do we collect such information and 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 i think yeah we probably also to criticize also the the research point of view that um maybe cultural historical issue at are not captured so well in the models. And typically we maybe know the level of wealth, gender to a certain extent, maybe age or who move or who doesn't move. But um to capture that that maybe there's some cultural explanation also that this hasn't been done much. And I think we can do more than that. And and I think one thing also conceptually when we think about I think it's good a good point to mention the culture historically, we tend to have this idea, oh, if climate change happened, people would want to move. But in fact, the proportion of population in the world who are international mi migrants are only three three percent. Typically people would like to stay away where they were born. And I think this is important to to highlight also when we when we conceptualize uh, climate related migration. Thank you. Uh, I see uh, Mrs. Uh, Zikraf is writing something. Do you also, is it just, do you want to react to on this or? Or I was, I was just typing so that I wasn't taking more time on the, the platform, but I, I was <laughs> just typing something along the lines of that, you know. Okay. And maybe if you have a quick answer or like. Maybe a, if there's another question, um, but I would just say, uh, yeah, I think that one of the simple solutions is that you don't tell people what to do and point to, you know, some place to go, but you, from the beginning, it's designed, if not led by the people who were affected, coming back to this idea of local knowledge, you design a relocation program that doesn't consider culture, doesn't consider uh, livelihoods, doesn't consider social structures. Uh, yeah, it's going to probably not go well. Um, but if from the very beginning, this is a consultative process, it's more likely to succeed. I think that that's quite, should be quite simple and, and a starting point for relocation programs. Um, otherwise you're using a lot of resources, a lot of money and time that could be um, better, better used, better implemented um, to no, no success. Um, do you agree, um, Mr. Abu? Yeah, so I, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Caroline and Briar said. So yes, migration is a right. So uh, uh, just looking at it from some other point of view and probably uh, feeling scared that maybe because of climate related issues, there will be a mass movement probably from, from Africa or from the global south, the global north. I think I think that is not really being supported by the literature, as the earlier speakers just said. Uh, but one thing we should also know is that uh, uh, let's look at our demographics very well uh, when we are making comments about some of these things. Okay, because uh, if you look at the demographics and if you look at the de demographics of Europe, uh, this is not a young population. This is an aging population. So. Uh, you may really need some of these people at any particular point in time. And migration is a right. There is nobody who will see an opportunity somewhere that my skills are needed. And so when I go through the right channels and get there, then it's a problem. I think what you should be, we should be more concerned about is probably to look into issues of probably undocumented migrants, which is 
which is also practically insignificant. Sometimes when you even look at the data, sometimes the way we want to hype it and uh, put in so much money into some of these things, trying to create borders in North Africa, trying to create all sorts of things. I think if the, 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 the origin areas are well developed, people have their right kind of jobs and those kind of things, <laughs> I'm sure most of these people will not move to Europe. So we, we, we need to look at some of these narratives very well. And then uh, at the end of the day, I think per the demographics, as I indicated, whether we like it or not, we will still need some of these migrants from the global south to support whatever that is going on in Europe. Ja, also wir sehen, vielen Dank, ähm, dass es ganz viele Aspekte Thank gibt. Thank you very much. So we do see that there are very many aspects which at a local level have to be included in our climate adaptation strategies. At the end of the discussion, I don't think there are any unanswered questions anymore. I would like to ask you to very briefly summarize in one or two sentences because I still have the question on my mind, how realistic do you think is it that every state, every region really, I mean, and now we just heard that many different aspects come into play and have to be contributed so that this climate adaptation strategies can really be developed at a local level. Mr. Bergman, uh, would you like to perhaps respond to this very briefly? Yes, uh, to be honest, I can only answer that for Germany. And fundamentally speaking, if this is not successful, we would restrict ourselves too much. That is, the money would be there if one limits, if, uh, if we don't limit ourselves too much politically. The minds for that are there. And I would like to respond to what Mr. Abu said, that Germany has a long time recognized that it must be an in-migration country and needs skilled labor. So also um, the um, heads would be there. Just the political willingness and the political competition, and this is what Ms. Zigraf said uh, regarding the power circumstances, are sometimes such that these breaks, which are there in the legal or financial sense, uh, cannot be resolved. And if we work on, on and fail on this transformation task, then because of the political power situation, but the resources and the possibilities for solution would be there if in a majority society like ours, these hurdles were pushed to the side. And sure, it's, um, you know, last year I was quite worried because of the uh, rightward movement in this country. The demonstrations that have taken place this year in Germany, my fear was that these political powers should not be allowed to win. And uh, these demonstrations we currently now instill a lot of hope in me. So I have the hope that we will be successful with that. Uh, it's not an optimistic statement, It will we will be successful, but my hope is that if political circumstances in this country here are also changing, then we will make it. Well, this was a positive wrap up at the end of this uh, panel discussion. I'm not sure whether we managed, because it's now half past already, to give all panelists the chance for a last word. But definitely, I would like to express my thanks for this really interesting discussion. I think we could continue this discussion much longer. So thanks to you for being here a lot. And also thanks uh, to the listeners. We will continue in 15 minutes time with the next panel. We will be growing. We are aging is its title now and later healthcare and demographic change. So many, many thanks to all of you.